In today's video, I'll be discussing digital potentiometers via a microchip technology IC. We'll go over the key specific parameters of the IC on DigiKey via its voltage serial communication protocol and purpose and function. We'll go through the block diagram along with the specific addresses and functions that you need to use in order to program it. I'll cover a brief overview of the schematic and layout of the board that I designed so that you can make your own breakout boards. And finally, we'll go through a quick code demonstration via STM32. The IC that I use for this breakout board is the MCP4541. It's a microchip technology IC with a resistor range of 109 ohms to 100 kilo ohms. It uses I squared C communication, has a total of 129 taps, and has a voltage supply range of 1.8 to 5.5 volts with a tolerance of plus or minus 20%. So it's not super accurate, but it's fairly accurate. And again, if you need something more accurate, just use either a voltage or current control DAC. That just depends on what you need for your given application. But this IC, I used it because it also has non-volatile memory, which means that after you power the IC down, it will retain the last resistor value that you programmed within the actual potentiometer itself. Now, by default, this potentiometer will have the highest possible resistor value, which is 100 kilo ohms. And if you want to adjust it, that's when you need to look in the data sheet and find the specific addresses that you need to send via the I squared C transmit function in order to actually update the device address and thus set a new resistor value. While I would like to cover I squared C more in depth, I feel that it would be a bit redundant given all of the articles and videos that already exist on this topic. So I figured I'd show you a application note from TI that goes over the protocol, physical layer, protocols that are similar to I squared C. And I think that it does a great job showing exactly how serial clock and serial data communicate with each other, given the read and write commands that are available with it. I also figured I'd show you a analog devices article that covers how to select a digital potentiometer dependent on whether or not you need volatile, non-volatile memory, accuracy, the number of bits, package size, and just some examples of using it as an attenuator, using it for gain control and op amps, along with using it as a discrete resistor. So both of these articles will be in the description of this video if you want to further do research after watching this. The first thing to do with a data sheet like this is to identify the resistance option that you have for your potentiometer along with the footprint. So as discussed earlier, we know we have a resistance option of 100K and we're using the MSOP footprint. So this means that we have a high voltage command address pin, serial clock, serial data, VSS represents our ground, P0A, P0W, and P0B all tie to our digital potentiometer, and VDD is our voltage supply pin. Now, the digital potentiometer itself is dependent on the number of steps that your pot has in total. So in my case, it's 129 steps. And since we know the total resistance that is available for this IC, we could take that total resistance and divide it by the number of steps to determine what each individual step of the resistor is. And we'll see this further down in the data sheet. If we look at page two, we have the block diagram of the IC itself which gives you a basic breakdown of how this IC is constructed with its I squared C interface, its VDD and VSS supply pins, along with the resistor network itself. So dependent on the actual IC that you select, you could either have one resistor network or multiple. And this is where your P0A, P0W, and P0B pins are tied. So A and B are simply the ends of the resistor, and the P0W pin is the wiper pin itself, which, again, adjusts the potentiometer. So looking at the device features table, we could see the control interface, the memory type, the RAB options, the number of steps, and the VDD operating range. So for example, if I choose the MCP46 Five, two, I have a total of 257 steps, which means that I can get a smaller resistor value as opposed to the 129 steps. The voltage supply range is slightly different for this, though they're pretty much in the same category of 1.8 to 5.5 volts. The higher step ones do require a higher starting voltage. However, typically when you're using an IC like this, you're going to be using 3.3 volts anyway. So it really shouldn't affect your device unless if you're using some sort of FPGA, which in that case it would. 
Before diving into the resistor network series of the data sheet, I wanted to go over the maximum output current that you could sync or source into the digital potentiometer. Here in the absolute maximum rating section, it says that it's 25 milliamps. And for the VDD and VSS pin, it's 100 milliamps. So if you want to use a digital potentiometer, just keep in mind that you can't use it for a high current application unless if there's some sort of isolation that protects the potentiometer from exceeding the given characteristics of its maximum ratings. And further down, always just make sure when you're going through data sheets to look at the parameters of your specific IC in terms of the amount of time it takes in order to perform its function, the supply range, the quiescent current, the power dissipation, the resolution in this case, tolerance, and anything else that is important to your given circuit. So now a lot of times the temperature range isn't usually that important, especially if you're just using it in your home or just for a standard circuit. However, if you're using it for other applications that are going to be in designs that tend to get to high temperatures, this is something that you're going to need to keep in mind. Now, if we go to the resistor network section, we could see that figure 5.1 here has a block diagram of each individual RS step resistor. Now it doesn't show all 128 or 257 as there's really no need to. That's what these three dots represents that it continuously increases the number of resistors dependent on the number of steps. And here we could see in equation 5.1, we have the RS calculation as discussed earlier for a seven bit device. If we further go down here in the data sheet, we could see an RWB calculation, which shows the wiper pin here and pin B here of the resistor terminal network. And in this case, again, because of the IC that I selected from DigiKey, it is the seven bit device formula. And we could see in table 5.2, the default factory setting selection. This is where I got the default factory resistance of 100 kilo ohms as discussed earlier. Table 6-2 of the datasheet shows the device slave address. We're mainly going to be focusing on the first row with the MCP45X1 as I'm using the MCP4541. The address is 010111B plus A0, where A0 is used for the high voltage commands. The high voltage command pin is simply used when you want to power the digital pot with 5 volts. Now for this demonstration, I only powered it with 3.3 volts, so I simply tied that pin to ground and we don't need to focus on it for determining the address. But what I have here is a little notepad kind of just going through the steps of how to figure this out. So we know our original address is 01011110, the B represents a zero in the address in the table here. And then we need to add a leading zero. So now the address is 0010. 1110, where 0010 is 2 and 1110 is E. So that makes our resulting address 0x2E. And if we left shift that address by placing a 0 here and then moving each bit to the left, we will get 01011100 or 0x5C. So basically, you just need to take your address, add the leading 0, make it 8 bits and then from there convert it from binary to hexadecimal. And that's what we did here. If we look at section seven, we could also see that there is a table for device commands. So in order to write data, we're simply going to need to send 0x00. And these are the only two commands that I'm gonna, going to be using for this demonstration, as there's a bunch of other ones where we could use data EEPROM, we could use volatile registers, and there's the whole table here in the whole section. I'll make sure to provide a link for the data sheet and the application notes that are in this data sheet that go further into using potentiometers for given applications such as op amp game as we discussed earlier. The schematic and layout for this board is very simple. All we have is the IC itself, two pull-up resistors for the serial clock and serial data lines, a 0.1 microfarad decoupling capacitor, and two 2.54 millimeter pin headers. Now, the way that I made this exactly fit on a breadboard was by simply multiplying by a scale of 2.54 millimeters. So, for instance, if you take 2.54 millimeters and you multiply that by 5, you are guaranteed to fit that board on a breadboard. Now, sometimes, depending on how far you spread apart the pin headers themselves, you may need to use two breadboards, but it will still fit across it. So that's just something to keep in mind. The data sheet recommended the capacitor on the VDD line, so that's why I put it there. Originally, I had 10K pull-ups for the serial clock and serial data. 
Typically, you can use 10K, but uh, a lot of people online recommended 4.7K, so I switched to those. And that's pretty much it in terms of the schematic. The layout, more or less the same. You could see here, this is 27.9400 millimeters in terms of the distance between pin one of each pin header. So if you take that and divide that by 2.54, you will get a non-decimal number, which is what you want. And all we really have here is just some 0.3 millimeter traces, some 0.5 millimeter traces for the VDD power line. And, you know, I just tried to spread apart the traces as best as I could. There is a power trace running underneath from the serial clock and serial data. However, these lines are pretty slow. So for something like this, it's not really a big deal. If these were faster signals, I would try and avoid this. But again, considering this is just a basic breakout board, this really isn't a big deal. And I'll just show you real quick a 3D view of this. Originally, when I soldered the pin headers on, I did it the other way. So this is how you're intended to do it if you actually want it to fit on the breadboard without it just coming loose every time you push it down. The way that I soldered it still works, but it's just not ideal if you want to actually use it on a breadboard consistently. So I just swapped the 3D model around to look like this, and this is a more accurate representation of what you want. But that's pretty much it in terms of the schematic and the PCB. Now let's move on to the code. Here is the IOC setup. If you're new to this channel, I use the Nucleo L476RG for prototypes. PB6 and PB7 are tied to serial clock and serial data. PA2 and PA3 are tied to USART2TX and USART2RX. PA5 is tied to a GPIO output, just in case if I want to blink the onboard LED. Under I2C1 for connectivity, I have a standard speed with a frequency of 100 kilohertz with all the other settings left as default. For USART2, I have an asynchronous mode of operation with a baud rate of 115200 bits per second. Everything else, once again, is left as default. Under the clock configuration tab, I have the PLL source MUX set to high speed internal and the system clock MUX set to PLLCLK with a frequency of 80 megahertz, which is the maximum. The actual code itself is split into separate source and header files. So I have a header file for UART, source file for it, header file for set potentiometer, source file for it. The header file of the UART is the function prototype along with some external variables. The actual source file has the function itself of UART censoring in which we're transmitting the data. The set pot header file has the function prototype for void set potentiometer in which it stores the wiper value. And the source file has the address of the IC that we selected, the wiper command, which is 0x00, an external variable, and the actual function of void set potentiometer in which we declare an array of data, the wiper command, and the wiper value. And then we use the how I2C master transmit to transmit that data in the array by left shifting the original address by one bit and we use the how maximum delay in order to perform this function. Then going back to the main here, we have the initialization of GPIO, I2C, and USART along with the integer of current wiper value, the I2C handle type definition, and the UART handle type definition. In the while loop here, we set the current wiper value equal to zero. We establish a for loop where we make an unsigned integer step equal to zero, make it less than or equal to 25, increment by one. The current wiper value is then equal to current wiper value plus five. So in this case, it would start at zero and add five to it. And then we set the potentiometer to the new wiper value. We then print this on the UART terminal and delay by one second or a thousand milliseconds. So now I'll just show you a quick demonstration of the actual code working. All right, so here's the setup. I have HVC tied to ground. I have my serial clock PB6 tied to the green wire here and serial data tied to PB7. I have 3.3 volts coming from a breadboard power supply that I designed. This is more so to just test that it works. I'll make a video on that soon. And I have digital pin A tied to ground. This is so that when we increment the potentiometer, it goes up in a positive order. If I wanted it to be negative, I would have tied digital pin B to ground, but in this case, I tied A to ground. So one other thing I wanted to mention was in terms of the actual resistance, how much it goes up each step. The first step from when it goes from zero to five and then five to 10, 
you simply take the step resistance, which in this case is approximately 775 ohms, and you multiply that by five, and that'll give us the 3.875 ohms. And we'll see that in just a second here. I have the UART terminal just spitting out the wiper value along with the step. All right, so here I'm measuring the resistance between the feedback pin and pin B. So if I press the reset button, we could see that it starts at 3.9, which is what we said earlier. And we could also see that the step resistance is working properly. So it's going up in an increment of five. If you simply just want a set resistance, all you would need to do to adjust the code is essentially take the for loop, get rid of it, set the current wiper value to whatever value that you want, and then just have the set potentiometer function of the current wiper value followed by a HAL delay. And then from there, you could set the resistance to 2K, 5K, 10K, all the way up to 100 kilo ohms. As always, thank you all so much for watching. Be sure to check out my recent videos going over manufacturing, programming STM32s, some hardware design, along with some programming. And I will be making a video on a breadboard power supply that I designed soon, and I'll go into the reason why I made that. I think I'm also going to delve into a little bit more of analog electronics to kind of just separate myself from doing constant programming and embedded engineering. But as always, thank you all for watching, and have a great day.